you enjoyed your lunch. Um, we're going to continue with the keynote sessions, and I would like to invite Dr. Jeremy Knox to take over. Today was, was this title, Post-Digital Methods for Post-Pandemic Time. And I don't really want to talk about any specific research agenda here, um, rather just uh, a number of ideas which I think are uh, hopefully quite um, useful for thinking about how we might approach um, research in, this, in these, these, these post-pandemic <coughs> times. I should say I'm a, a co-director of the Centre for Research in Digital Education, which is based at the University of Edinburgh. There's our website if you want to go and look at the range of research we do around principally um, the relationships between higher education and, uh, and digital technologies. I think my timer. And uh, one of the things um, I'm also co-directing at the moment is uh, a fully online master's in digital education. And uh, that's not just a plug. Uh, that is quite important because um, what we've tried to do for many years is link that master's with our research centre to do kind of uh, research-led teaching around what it means to conduct um, education online and what it means to conduct education with technology. Um, and I'm going to try to make some relations there with talking about uh, uh, the other things that universities do uh, in, in terms of uh, research. And what, um, and I'll, I'll come back to a bit more of that link in, in a moment, but what I wanted to begin the talk with uh, was suggesting that there is a bit of an emergence of a, of a discourse, if you like, around how we might respond as universities to the COVID-19 pandemic. Suggestions about overcoming the pandemic as a problem. Um, uh, the online pivot in higher education, and this is hopefully a phrase that lots of you are familiar with, a phrase which I want to suggest uh, infers a sort of simplistic, straightforward, shift into an online mode without any problems, um, effective institutional online pivots, pivoting academic skills, um, effective practices for online teaching, a phi digital, presumably there, uh, inferring some sort of relationship between the physical and the digital, and COVID-19 online pivots, adapting uh, university teaching to social distancing. So a lot of that discourse is specifically related to teaching and learning, but the thing I want to suggest is um, that this is potentially also a, a becoming a, a, a prominent way of talking about doing research in these supposed post-pandemic time, times. And finally, um, an explicit suggestion here for hacking the great online pivot, hacking referring to uh, directly to producing technology to sort of make this online pivot happen. So I don't want to sort of single out any of these articles. That's why I have I've removed the names for, from, from uh, these, these uh, titles. I'm not singling out any of these as in, in line for any particular sort of critique around the, the use of, of particular terms. Rather, it is to suggest a caution in the general sense that we might start to talk about how we are going to use technologies to engage in this supposed new post-pandemic world of uh, uh, um, engaging in research. And I wanted to begin that just by going through a, a bit of a sort of philosophy of technology 101. And some of you might be familiar with this sort of term, but I do think it's important to sort of come back and, and familiarize ourselves with these if, if you already are. And, and, and the reason for that is I think there are often positions that are and assumptions that are taken about the role of technology. Uh, um, in particular, I think we can see this in response uh, to the pandemic and the idea of the online pivot. So, instrumentalism, this is the idea, as Hamilton and Friesen suggest here, technology is positioned as nearly a set of passive tools 
used to achieve the predefined aims of users. So what they're talking about here is an idea of technology neutrality. The technology doesn't have any agency or role in, uh, in shaping uh, what is done as an outcome uh, when it's used. Another sort of um, uh, uh, key term here is solutionism or technological solutionism as of Jamie Morozov has uh, written about uh, quite prominently specifically in relation to Silicon Valley type technologies. And what he's sort of critiquing <coughs> here is the idea that technology is, is framed entirely as a, in terms of its ability to provide solutions and specifically solutions to problems and he, he specifically talks about this sort of framing in the development of technology the definition of a problem and the engineering of a, of a solution. And he, and he calls this out as a quite a problematic framing of how technology is developed, uh, particularly uh, prominent in uh, computer science and engineering kind of disciplines. And I think what he's very clever at doing is pointing out that when we want to critique this kind of way of developing digital technology, it's often the definition of the problem is the thing that we need to look at. Uh, technology solutions are often very elegant and clever, but they're often positioned against an ill-defined uh, and, and a narrowly defined problem of what uh, uh, the particular uh, social situation might be. And another key, um, uh, 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 and I think problematic way of um, uh, talking about technology that we are seeing in some of the discourse emerging around the pandemic is a sort of maintenance of the, the holding separate of society and technology, of humans and technology. As Bain says here, bracketing off technology uh, from social activity, which is expressive of a more fundamental division of society from technology. And Hamilton and Friesen again here talk about that in the sense of uh, a desire to preserve technology as an independent realm, as they say here, of pure technical and scientific law unsullied by the differences, values, or interests that typify the social world. So there's a holding apart of, um, of society and technology that I think is another sort of problematic way that we might think about um, technology in this post -pandemic, these post-pandemic times. However, some of the discourse around um, the, the, the shifts that universities are undertaking at the moment does address that gap. A little bit, and this is where this term hybrid, I think, is potentially quite useful. This is an article from the Times Higher Education here talking about um, higher education going hybrid. That seems to suggest, I think, uh, something of a productive direction towards acknowledging the campus and the online, the physical and the digital. This is again primarily in the context of teaching and learning at higher, ed higher education institutions. But of course, we want to, uh, I want to suggest that this is also relevant for thinking about methods. But I think the term, as uh, Rika Norgard suggests here, the term hybrid also needs a bit of critique. She suggests here hybridity, hybrid learning environments and hybrid learning carry with them particular conceptualizations, characteristics and frameworks which we, uh, we need to bear in mind when thinking about lifelong learning in a post-pandemic world. And she goes on, I think, even more usefully to, to critique the idea that hybrid institutions are being proposed as a sort of technical solution for the problems of the pandemic and suggests, I think more productively, an understanding, this is the second part of the quote here, an understanding of hybridity as a certain kind of institutional or academic being connected to deep structures of theory, method and practice within the field of uh, hybrid higher education. So that's, I think, something to emphasise here is what I'm wanting to suggest is when thinking about the use of technology in this supposed post-pandemic world that we're in. We need to think uh, much less about technical solutions and much more about, uh, as Norval says here, this, this uh, idea of a sort of deep engagement with theory, uh, method and practice in terms of hybridity, in terms of thinking about technology, society um, um, uh, entangled and in, in some kind of hybrid configuration. There are, of course, a whole uh, uh, um, array of um, theoretical perspectives that we might use to underpin that approach towards methods. One which is emerging is particularly prominent in my own field, which is digital education, is a term, is the term post-digital. Just had some, uh, uh, been used, I think, a lot more in, uh, in sort of the area of the humanities. I think there's a center for post-digital 
research here at Coventry, so it's a, it's a fairly prominent term. And what Yandrich and I'll, uh, suggest, and I'll suggest here, we are increasingly no longer in a world where digital technology and media is separate, virtual, other, to a natural human and social life. So I think it's this kind of underpinning that I think we can take forward to uh, thinking about, uh, um, about methods. And of course, there's other theoretical perspectives we could use here, post-humanism, active network theory, feminist technoscience, uh, not just the post-digital. And I think there is a sense that, um, um, and I know I keep using the phrase, this supposed post-pandemic uh, era that we're in, there is some suggestion that, uh, that we are um, uh, entering into a, an era where digital technologies are becoming more, more prominent in our lives and, and often problematically so. This is from the Pew Research Center who engage in um, uh, sort of large-scale research around technology. And we can see here from uh, these are suggestions from uh, uh, groups of experts about, uh, about these issues, um, three rather worrying suggestions for, for the sort of new normal. I should say there, there was another one that was quite positive about technology, but overall the findings from this uh, report uh, were rather gloomy. Worsening economic inequality, specifically related to the difference between the sort of tech savvy and those without digital access. Um, enhanced power of big technology firms and um, sort of multiplication in the spread of misinformation. These are issues that I think um, are going to be very prominent in, uh, in, in, in uh, the, the, the very near future. And for me, suggest this situation of deep entanglements between society and technology that we need research methods to, in some sense, un untangle. And what I want to do in this talk, and which I'll, what I'll do in the, the remainder of it, is suggest um, that it would be productive to look backwards rather than forwards in terms of thinking how we might approach research methods in this uh, post-digital era. I, I don't want to suggest that um, this, this sort of outlook requires us to rethink the idea of doing, doing research, or the, the idea that we're now suddenly online or all now suddenly in a sort, some sort of hybrid living as necessitating new kinds of research methods. What I think it's productive for us to do is look back and look back specifically at work which emerged around um, an era where um, uh, uh, computer-mediated communication was starting to uh, support um, social networks and community online. And this is one of the, one of the well-known ones uh, from Howard Reingold, which um, is sort of famous as one of, the, uh, one of the, the key works which made the case that one could be social and one could communicate with technology. And that might sound like um, not very uh, startling outcome these days, but Back in the, the late 80s and early 90s, I think it's fair to say that most people view technology in a sort of pure, hard, cold, rational uh, kind, of, kind of spaces, devoid of anything that we would um, assume to be social or cultural. And there was a significant body of work which started to emerge around the 1990s. These are just two um, uh, um, papers that are often quoted as early examples of work which argued for online spaces and online communication being sites of authentic community and authentic um, interaction and communication. And this was, um, at the time, uh, an, unusual, an unusual sort of claim. Um, Nancy Baim, uh, again, is another, I think, key figure in this area and who uh, went on to um, be one of the founders of the Association of Internet Researchers, which is now a big sort of uh, uh, community of scholars who are again still uh, working on, 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 on this, this, kind of, uh, this, this kind of area. So what I want to emphasize in, in looking at that work is this um, claim that it, it has already been there and has already been there for some time in, in, uh, and has been argued very well in this work. This is from Tom Bolstall, who clearly writing a little bit later, but was one of the, the figures uh, um, in doing um, uh, this, this kind of research at the time suggests one of the most important theoretical and political issues haunting contemporary theories of technology is the opposition of the digital to the real. So what these, this research was doing, and which was emerging in the 1990s, was trying to really argue that 
online communication and online culture could be very, very real um, and not inauthentic. So I think it's, it's those sorts of ideas that we might usefully return to when we're thinking about this new situation where supposedly um, more people are, are online and interacting online. So let me give you an example of some what I think is really interesting work from that time. This is um, uh, some work from uh, T.L. Taylor, who's a professor at MIT, and at this time was researching early examples of um, virtual worlds. So if anybody's familiar with virtual worlds nowadays, this probably looks like a very crude example. This is a two-dimensional graphical representation of an early um, uh, social space online where users could log in, create an avatar, customize that avatar, and then place the avatars in a in, a, in a, uh, a shared space for social communication. This was rather, I think, unusual and niche at the time, but uh, uh, hopefully we can see that this sort of uh, social idea online has become uh, a lot more prominent since. And I think when you look back at some of this work, particularly of T.L. Taylor, you start to see what I think are very articulate and very important um, uh, uh, suggestions about how these sorts of spaces um, allowed people to uh, express uh, very sophisticated ideas of presence, online and offline presence, affiliation with others, socialization, and these are uh, themes from the, the particular paper.